Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host Ashutosh Garg and today I'm delighted to welcome a very very accomplished uh, technology entrepreneur, come professor Mr. Ravi Shankar from India. Ravi, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ashutosh. I'm glad to be uh, part of this uh, interaction and discussion. Going forward. Thank you. Uh, Ravi, uh, or I should have said Dr. Ravi Shankar. Yeah. Ravi is a visiting professor for artificial intelligence and machine learning and is a venture partner. He has mentored agribusinesses and ag tech startups for over three decades. And uh, he is a teacher, mentor and advisor. So Ravi, let's now talk about agribusinesses and ag tech startups. What would you say are three of the key issues or challenges most agriculturists in India face today? Uh, uh, okay. Um, when you say agriculture, you mean the farmers? Farmers. Farmers. Okay. farmers. Yeah. The, um, they, 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 um, uh, farmers, uh, you know, the, if you look at the uh, our country landscape, mm-hmm. it's structurally um, you know, very uh, different from most others in the sense that 90, almost 90% of our farmers are smallholders, i.e. they have uh, one to f- two to three acres uh, land holding uh, size on an average. Uh, that's one part of the problem, um, mm-hmm. but, but um, we'll come to that in a bit. Mm-hmm. Apart from that, they also face a lot of risks, mm-hmm. right? Uh, both I would categorize them into two buckets, biotic and abiotic. Mm-hmm. When I say this, if I may elaborate for a few seconds, yeah. so right from climate, weather, rainfall, uh, and all of that temperature, moisture, humidity, etc., right. etc., mm-hmm. all the way to market risks, you know, mm-hmm. the price, you're not sure. So the farmer's life is fraught with risk. Many, mm-hmm. many decades back, years back, we say that uh, Indian farmers' life is a gamble with the monsoon. But Correct. now you can add, uh, along with monsoon, market price, input, output, everything is a gamble. Mm. But having said that, in the last few years, there's been a systematic uh, effort by both the center and the state because ultimately agriculture is a state subject, it's right. not, not the central subject. So the center formulates policies, but the state has to implement it at the village mm. level. Mm. So I think there's been a lot of progress, a lot of tech solutions are coming uh, that, that could solve the structural issues. Mm-hmm. And the structural issues are very vexed. It's not easy to solve at the scale that, that, that we are in India. Right. Six and a half lakh villages, but long story cut short, I think um, uh, the, the market risks, the weather risk, the climate risks are two major challenges for for farmers today in mm. India. Yep. Very fascinating. And uh, you know, you've been working on technology, you know, AI, ML, and a lot of other technology. How are you using technology to mitigate the risks that you have just spoken about? Right. Yeah, I think uh, that's that's uh, one potent solution and it holds a lot of promise. And mm-hmm. we can see, we are seeing some early green shoots mm-hmm. uh, where, uh, you know, all the concepts have been validated. And uh, I can see that um, the startups who come up with such innovative solutions, which I will outline, I'll give two, three examples sure. um, uh, for the benefit of the audience is that, um, that the, they have been implemented and farmers have started to start begin to use it. So what are these? So one of the um, uh, uh, nicest things that I can think of is, you know, uh, look at insurance, right? So one of the biggest ways to mitigate risk is through covering farmers uh, with, with insurance. Correct. Now, we know that pow- farmers cannot afford to pay insurance. Mm. But yeah, uh, so one of the um, non-for-profits that I'm associated called as Gram Patshala mm-hmm. is exactly doing this. We are tied up with our 25 insurance companies at the back. Mm. We're sitting with their product design teams. And we are coming up with new micro chassis affordable, accessible insurance products, mm-hmm. uh, which the farmers don't have to pay, which will be bundled with the inputs, whether it's fertilizers, seeds, uh, you know, the technology solutions that everybody's wanting to sell to the farmers. Mm-hmm. So that way it is frictionless and embedded. A, uh, it reduces the cost of uh, doing business, which is, you know, increasingly becoming tougher and unsustainable for smallholders, right, right from seed insurance to weather insurance to yield insurance, all of that is covered to farm mm. equipments, to even animals, livestock, mm. everything and any, everything can be, but it requires a new um, uh, unconventional bold approach based on using satellite data at one right. level mm. and sensor data at the farm level. 
Mm-hmm. So if you superimpose satellite imagery data and sensor data, sensors becoming damn cheap. You know, everybody can afford now. Right. Even small holders can afford it. So you you superimpose these two data sets, and you know what? You have micro insurance that is affordable and accessible. Okay. Maybe something like three hundred rupees. You know what? Mm-hmm. And you know what? The farmer doesn't have to pay for it. You know, so uh, that's the beauty. This is one great example I can think where we can really mitigate the risk that is associated mm-hmm. with farming. The second one is let's look at something on the output side, right? So mm-hmm. you know we all know that farmers grow, mm-hmm. right? Whether scientifically or most of the time um, in their own ways. Mm-hmm. So uh, any commodity, maybe coffee, potato, wheat, rice, mm-hmm. tomatoes, whatever he or she is growing, mm-hmm. the the rubber meets the road when he or she harvests and then he has he or she has to sell. Correct. And there are multiple ways, right? There are markets, there are B two B players, there are aggregators, mm-hmm. all of that. But the biggest thing is the quality, right? The price that you would command in the market, whether B two B, B two C, or through government mandates or through private mandates, a lot of liberalisation, farm reforms have taken place in the last few years. But what price I will command depends upon a the supply and demand situation, which is mm-hmm. beyond my individual control as a farmer. Mm-hmm. Uh, two, the quality of produce that I'll be. Uh, uh, cultivating and getting into the market, so I have to grade my produce. So, the, 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 this this so there's this um, a startup called is Intello Labs, mm-hmm. right? Now Intello Labs is funded by Omnivore, mm-hmm. right? It's a it's a, it's a well known agri tech VC, right? They have, they have been in, uh, in, in around for for four five years, and they come with these wonderful solutions where you use computer vision mm-hmm. um, and um, uh, convolutional neural nets, mm-hmm. right? That's the machine learning part. Mm-hmm. To to scan the produce at mm-hmm. scale, right? Otherwise, imagine human eyes. Let's say you have got in a market twenty tons of tomatoes. Can you mm-hmm. go and look at each crate or each fruit? It's impossible, right? right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's how people used to do it manually. But now you have got this wonderful automation using computer vision and uh, convolutional neural net technology, mm-hmm. where it scans produce, whether it's tomato, cereals, grains, mm-hmm. coffee, you name it. And there are a few other firms also which are coming up, but Intel Labs is a fine example of how mm-hmm. they are able to solve what is a, a, a automated, inefficient, drudgery kind of a process into mm-hmm. highly automated, uh, scalable, affordable, and accurate solution, mm-hmm. so that you can grade the produce and then get the right price that you deserve to get at the first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Two examples. I can go on on till the cows Very come home. But yeah. But tell me, you know, uh, one of the other things that I was reading about. I'm not uh, an expert in this area, but I was also reading that one of the problems is that productivity uh, yeah. of farms across the country is very different. Yes. And you know, there are multiple inputs to productivity. Right. How is technology changing productivity for farmers? Yeah, a big way, big way. Uh, ultimately, you know, agriculture is a democratic process, right? right? Any farmer can grow anything and do whatever he or she wants. Mm. We are true democracy that way. Yeah. Uh, but but having said that, let me give some examples again. Uh, the best it's best understood by taking a practical uh, yeah. illustration. Mm-hmm. So you know, uh, when it comes to productivity, uh, which is yield per acre, ultimately that's mm-hmm. the key metric for a farmer, mm-hmm. uh, which is a proxy for the income he or she will get. Eventually, right. is mm-hmm. India unfortunately is uh, if you take any crop right from rice, wheat to uh, horticultural crops to plantation crops to coffee to to, to potatoes, tomatoes to mm-hmm. cereals. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, India has been at the lower end of the spectrum when it comes to productivity. Right. And if you take like with China, for example, right, there are large amount of smallholders there also, unlike US and Australia where you have large mm-hmm. farmers. Uh, but China has some of the highest productivity levels. How come? Mm. One acre of paddy will give you three x the output. Same farmer here will get one x. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of reasons why productivity is low. But how the more important thing is how technology has enabled to improve productivity in the last few okay. uh, years, maybe a decade or two. So the biggest component that goes into productivity, if you're looking at agriculture, is seed. Right. The quality of the germplasm, the seed that you sow, mm. matters a lot. Right. So uh, studies, research studies have indicated that 25 to 30 percent of the total factor productivity, as we call TFP, in mm-hmm. its econometric term, uh, is constituted a, a portion by the seed. Mm-hmm. So the quality of seed determines 30 percent of your output. Okay. Then the package of practices, then irrigation, then the chemicals, then the nutrients, then mm-hmm. management, blah blah blah. But seed, 30 percent of your output, is accounted by the quality of the germplasm. So now right. look at it. 
there are a lot of public sector research institutes as well as private seed companies who are producing and distributing and marketing quality seeds. Mm. But the question is that, you know, uh, there should be, there is regulation on the quality of seed, but then on ground, there's uh, implementation is, is, is a long way to go. So, but day in, day out, especially in the public sector, uh, whether it's ICER or state agriculture universities, mm-hmm. they do wonderful research and they're coming up with newer uh, high-yielding varieties, newer hybrids, mm-hmm. uh, which will give more output for the same input or lesser inputs. Uh, but the thing is that then marketing is done by the private uh, industry, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And there, there, that's where, you know, the government has to, the state governments have to keep a hawk eye on the quality control right. of seed. That is, mm-hmm. That's one. The other way to improve productivity is let's take irrigation, you know, without water, Right. Nothing that you are no farmer Absolutely. can do much. Mm. Uh, so therefore, this drip irrigation, right? What we say more, uh, more yield per drop, mm-hmm. not acre per drop right. of water. Correct. You know, the biggest scarcity that we will uh, we will uh, kind of encounter as humankind is uh, water scarcity going right. forward. Mm. Mm. So therefore, drip irrigation technology, which kind of you know, the Israelis kind of uh, propounded and uh, finished it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's been around for 30, 40 years, 50 years. But then now I see widespread adoption of drip irrigation technologies. I, uh, I, I, as opposed to 100 liters, I can do it in one liter, wow. right? You know what? And it is targeted at the roots of the crop. And, you know, there are sensors which tells you stop. This much is enough as opposed to flooding the, 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 the plot. That's what mm-hmm. uh, conventional way it's been done. Right. Uh, so therefore, I think drip irrigation technology is a great example of how to improve productivity using mm-hmm. less water mm-hmm. at the same time. Similarly, you have a lot of um, other solutions. Like, for example, today, it's all the era of uh, chemical-free, organic, mm-hmm. um, ecologically safe, uh, consumption uh, perspective, nutritionally enhanced. So you have this bio-nano fertilizers, right? Okay. Bio-nano fertilizers. Mm-hmm. Na- earlier, you need, like said, 10 kgs of urea, DAP, and Bax, right? So mm-hmm. it's a huge quantity of chemicals that you throw uh, the crop so that you know it gets the nutrients mm-hmm. but now you have this nano fertilizers which are bio fertilizers all you need is a liter a small little of bottle and okay. you spray it you know it does the job of you know uh, 10 and 20 30 50 kgs of fertilizers that you're otherwise doing it mm-hmm. and you know what you spray it by a drone because one of the biggest other problem that i see is mm-hmm. labor scarcity mm-hmm. right you don't get the right labor and the right amount and type of labor in rural India. Mm. Uh, this is becoming a complex problem. So therefore, you just take a drone, you get precision, you get accuracy of spray, you get uh, mm, uh, a lower cost and faster. So these are the three great examples that I can think of how to improve productivity. Fascinating. Fascinating. So Ravi, you also spoke about seeds. Yep. And a question that comes to my mind is that this big uh, debate that keeps happening on the uh, genetically modified seeds. Um, for our viewers and listeners, tell us uh, what are the real challenges of GM, and are the, you know, in your opinion, are they good or not good? Mm. It's a it's an interesting but a controversial question, uh, Ashish, right. as you know, Ashutosh, as you know. So uh, I will I'll try to give you a more technologically sure. scientific balanced perspective. Absolutely. Uh, there are two schools of thought, clearly, right? Uh, I don't want to call them groups or lobbies, but yeah. two schools of thoughts. But as a scientist, right, as an agriculture economist, and a lot of my friends who are plant biotechnologists, plant geneticists, and so on and so forth, who are real experts. But mm-hmm. my perspective is simple. No technology by itself is good or bad. Mm-hmm. It's how you apply it makes all the difference. But again, mm-hmm. the choice, um, as a nation, we need to decide on a few parameters. Okay? And one is the state perspective or the national perspective. Other is the individual freedom, mm. right? Uh, let's say I'm a consumer. I, I, I'm, I'm indifferent whether I'll eat GM, my, GM maize or GM rice mm. or GM brinjal. Then if I'm indifferent to it, I should have the choice. But mm. again, there are um, connotations um, that is beyond an individual uh, choice framework. There's a national um, connotation. There is health connotation. Mm. There is an ecological connotation. So GMO essentially means that you're getting genes from other crops. Mm. Uh, for example, the first GM crop was in cotton. Mm. So what, what the cotton requires a lot of pesticides, tons mm. and tons of pesticides, toxic, harmful chemicals you have to spray because of the pink bollworm. That's mm-hmm. the biggest pest for cotton. 
Uh, so therefore, you, you know, the conventional thing was you keep spraying, spraying, spraying 10 rounds, 15 rounds of spray, toxic mm-hmm. chemicals. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, then, you know, some scientists in the US, they, they found a naturally occurring bacteria, mm-hmm. uh, Bt, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, in soil. Mm-hmm. And they found that you take the gene of that Bt uh, bacteria and, and implant it in the cotton plant, mm-hmm. it will naturally control the pink bollworm. I see. So, okay. yeah, that was revolutionary when it happened 15, 20, 25 years back. Mm. But you know what? There's school, two schools of thought. They say, hey, look, then you're tinkering with the life. Uh, you cannot get uh, organism gene or mm. DNA protein sequence from another organism and put it in plant. Mm. Uh, so now, that, now, now there is another paradigm. It says that, look, within the plant itself, can we do the tinkering, which is what mm-hmm. is happening. So it, there's interspecies and intraspecies. Okay. And there are people who are very having strong opinions on ecology. They say that it's, it's, it will cause genetic pollution, mm. for example. And there's this whole angle of multinationals and, mm. and capitalism, you yeah. know. So there are, it's an extremely complex scenario and, 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 and a controversial topic. But I would say that, look, um, you know, it's for the country. It's for the citizens of the country to, to, to have a, uh, a kind of a, a informed opinion and a debate. As to so, look for example, non-edible crops, mm-hmm. uh, crops that we don't eat, right? So, for example, can can we introduce GM? Because cotton is largely non-edible. Some parts mm-hmm. of cotton, like the cotton seed oil and cotton cake, so, is, is fed mm-hmm. to cattle also. But largely, it's used for mm-hmm. shirts and fabric. You know, so it's not edible. You don't mm-hmm. eat a cloth. But you know, what about BT brinjal? There's a problem. BT rice. But mm-hmm. you know. On the one hand, technology offers you a lot of um, advantages of fortifying minerals and vitamins into the crop and making them resistant to pest and disease. Otherwise, which you have to anyway put tons and tons of toxins and chemicals, mm-hmm. toxic chemicals. You know this uh, this uh, this famous story about cancer express from Punjab mm-hmm. to to Delhi all the way. So all of this could be avoided. But yes, there are pros and cons. One has right. to take an informed opinion, and I will rest my case saying that yes. look, no technology is good or bad. It's how you apply it. Correct. No, very well said. And I must compliment you. This is the first time I've heard such a good explanation of uh, GM seeds. So I've got one more question relating to uh, agriculture before I move to your next avatar as a venture partner. You also mentioned uh, about uh, organic uh, crops. Right. Very briefly. Right. I would love to understand how important is organic farming? in our lives and uh, do you see our country gradually moving towards organic farming yes uh, this the answer to the second part is yes mm-hmm. uh, there is already a distinct uh, trend and a movement that is happening and i'll give you examples at a, mm-hmm. at a, at a scale mm-hmm. uh, and the first part is yes organic agriculture is nothing but chemical free agriculture Correct. Right? Uh, so uh, so it's it's very clear what you mm-hmm. are what you eat and there, there, there's very, uh, you don't need a scientist to tell you that all the toxic uh, chemicals and pesticides and nutrients, fertilizers we are dumping onto the crop and the mm-hmm. ground and the water, everything is getting uh, polluted and compromised. And ultimately, it results in all kinds of um, health issues, mm-hmm. uh, right from cancer to deformities and all of that. That's well proved. Okay. So organic agriculture is something that we have, if you look at India as a country, we have been doing that in uh, since centuries. Correct. It's only in the 60s, 50s, 60s, we started using chemicals to improve the productivity. Mm-hmm. But now there's, I see that this, the, the circle is kind of taking a, a turn and we are coming Correct. back to it. In the last 10 to 15 years, mm-hmm. there has been a distinct movement on the ground, farmers on their own, Mm. And even consumers, if you look at cities like Gurugaon, mm. Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, Mumbai, you have stores which sells organic products, fresh vegetables, yeah. organic cereals mm. at a premium. Mm. For example, I subscribe to organic vegetables mm. twice a week and I'm paying twice the cost mm. apple to apple. Apple to apple meaning this. Let's take, yeah. um, uh, say, organic um, tomatoes, mm. right? Uh, it, that costs 80 rupees a kg. Mm. But a normal one, which is grown just the traditional chemical way, mm. is 40 rupees. Mm. I'm willing to pay 2x because in my mind, I'm thinking at least it's the lesser poison and lesser evil, right? Mm. So one, you get choice for the consumer. But look look at Northeast. Sikkim perhaps is the first state to Correct. be declared Complete. as an organic, yeah. completely organic strike. And, and uh, not only domestic consumption, abroad, especially in EU, Japan, there's a great demand for organically cultivated products and pr- the process also. Therefore, I think the future is organic, clearly. But we cannot 
uh, say that you know today all of a sudden what we have been doing for 50 years mm. uh, we will forget and there'll be wholesale switch mm. it's not an automatic switch I that know. it turn off and turn on but i see that consumers are becoming trained and you and even, even, uh, your farmers and the cultivators and producers are reaping benefits of switching to organic cultivation mm. for their own consumption benefit and they're getting a premium in the market as well but it takes 3 to 5 years to switch from a chemical uh, laden process and soil to a organic that switch is difficult but i can give you thousands and hundreds of examples of farmers who switched to chemical free farming successfully fascinating. successfully fascinating fascinating so ravi i'm now going to move to the next segment and i have time for two or three more questions uh, you also mentioned that you are a venture partner right i'd love to understand the role that you play as a venture partner sure uh now i turned a senior venture partner with the early stage venture mm-hmm. partner called as ah ventures okay um based on mumbai and uh, i i i i put i i kind of uh, i have two hats that i wear at uh, mm-hmm. ah ventures uh, one is as uh, as a senior venture partner we look at promising startups mm-hmm. and try to help them with mentoring and funding right ultimately fundraising is why startups approach us mm-hmm. and uh, my focus uh, as per, so our ventures is agnostic to the se- sector or vertical of mm-hmm. the startup i personally look at agri tech insure tech health tech mm-hmm. and also social impact space i see um, that's one thing where i i look at promising startups try to curate them through a four step mm-hmm. process and help them with funding mm-hmm. and we have various ways in which we fund we do angel funding we do institutional funding we do a permutation combination of both mm-hmm. we have what is called as fast care Uh, where venture partners and uh, ourselves put in our money mm. then we have high tables for 1 million and more up to 10 million where we also co invest with other vcs mm. you know for example so there are multiple options there uh, mm. that's one hat where i wear the second thing is uh, we just uh, october 15 this year we launched our learning academy mm-hmm. where we are, we are offering um i will not say courses but where we are offering knowledge sharing sessions mm-hmm. to startup ecosystem uh, where we focus on unconventional not a run of the mill topics like design thinking for startups mm-hmm. right agile framework for uh, startups mm-hmm. uh, team dynamics for startup ecosystem where mm-hmm. which is not typical financial modeling or fundraising Uh, and not those kind there are plenty of those but what it really takes to, to kind of uh, make scale up a startup to make it successful this kind of topics which we launch so i am very active in the learning academy i i am much less at this age interested in deal making and making that. understand also but, but yeah uh, i've got time for my last question and my question to you is that when you wear your hat as uh, you know uh, an agri expert uh you know that anything in agriculture takes time when you wear your hat as an an investor you want returns as quickly as possible yeah you cannot how wait. do you reconcile hmm. the need to uh make an investment and wait for a long time all right um, um so you know that's that's kind of a paradox right uh, ashutosh a wonderful question at that so mm-hmm. you know um smart investors are uh, those investors who know they do the due diligence they understand the sector at least mm-hmm. to the extent that is required before you put the money in mm-hmm. be it your money or institutional money correct so uh, the thing is uh, so therefore we have a set of uh, uh, vcs for example i give the example of omnivore you have omdr you have uh, avishkar mm-hmm. so you need a different mindset to look at agriculture you're right there mm-hmm. is a inherent gestation period you may have a wonderful technology solution but mm-hmm. uh, to validate it and scale it at impact right. uh, and grow the solution it takes time mm-hmm. and agriculture itself one has to be patient mm-hmm. as well because there are a lot of factors that are not in your control therefore i think you need to have the right mindset as an investor to say hey look long term doesn't mean 10 15 years no mm-hmm. at least 3 years 2 years maybe at the most 5 years but okay. if you have that kind of a horizon 3 to 5 i mm-hmm. think you can still get a wonderful irr as much as any other sector retail banking healthcare whatever right so but yeah uh, agri agri tech investing or uh, requires a different uh, mindset one mm. is to be patient but uh, i like i always uh, keep hypothesizing 
the potential is almost infinite absolutely right yeah absolutely wonderful ravi uh, thank you so much it's been such a pleasure speaking to you thank you for taking me through such in so much detail on agriculture the challenges being faced you spoke to us about uh, the genetically modified seeds you spoke about organic farming and then of course you told us your views on investment thank you again and good luck thank you ashutosh likewise it's a pleasure talking to you uh, have a good day bye bye for now bye thank you for listening to the brand called you video cast and podcast a platform that brings you knowledge experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals you can also follow us on youtube facebook instagram and twitter just search for the brand called you